it's a cliche, but life really is about the journey in recovery, in health, in gender identity. Where we end up isn't always what matters most. It's in finding the path that we discover the joy of exploration. How can we know who we are or who we long to be until we've let ourselves touch the possibilities and truly chosen the life we want? This is Not In Vain, a podcast about addiction, mental health and recovery in all its forms. My name is Honor Script, a recovered ex-addict and drag weirdo. My opinions are my own, and don't forget, listening to podcasts isn't treatment. If you're worried about your substance use, please seek professional advice. Some people may also benefit from mutual aid groups. On this episode, I've invited Stevie Teal to share her journey with us. We're going to be chatting about gender, addiction and recovery. Okay, so welcome Stevie. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, it's good. Brilliant, and thanks for coming on. So I thought we'd start off by talking a little bit about your your experience of exploring your gender, because I know it's been quite a journey for you. Do you want to just tell me a little bit about, about your experience? Yeah, well, I've always had an issue with my body and the way that it looks. And I think for me, I've never really understood what it was until quite late on in life um, and obviously I'd met some trans people before and I kind of when I met trans people I kind of connected and seen the similarities and thought wow I must that must be me then you know because it was kind of similar um, so I started to explore it and things like that and predominantly look at like services and stuff and things that were around and kind of like it's been a bit up and down really hasn't it like I've had like you know times when I've been quite masculine um because I think that's really important to say because a lot of people I think when we first come out as trans in general or non-conform and we feel as if we have to like fit into a binary and that binary has to be the, the solid binary that makes sense I don't know but like yeah. you know like if you're male you have to be male and if you're female you've got to be female and you've got to be like and if you're like non-conforming you kind of like feel as if you have to be more one or the other and I think that that's really important that people know that that's not the case um, and for me, that's not really been my journey. And then obviously, you know, as you're aware, I went back to being a girl for a period of time um, and thought that I was quite non-conforming. Um, and then I thought, yes, I'm 100% going to be male again. And now I'm back to being a bit like androgynous. I, I kind of like, if I'm going to describe it to anyone, I'm a bit like Annie Lennox. Um, that kind of gender you know like and I feel as if now because I've had a, like I'm working on some stuff um personal stuff in terms of like therapy and things um that I kind of see that maybe a lot of my issues are related to my past and I'm working on that at the moment and I'm quite happy in my body now as a female and I, I'm 100% certain that you know but it doesn't mean that I'm not 100% female do you know I still like you know I just I just do me and that's important I think definitely yeah. that's the important thing isn't it is is being comfortable in your skin and and knowing who you are even if that does change over time it's it's honoring mm. the way that you feel right now yeah definitely no, it's brilliant so do you use she her pronouns now I do yes I decided to go for it um a recommendation from a professional um to maybe like try living in the way that I am now as a female and say how I feel and it, I'm really loving it I'm enjoying it it's been good I've been able to explore and on the morning I just I just do what I want to do you know and that, like and I think that's really important that we should like be able to do that in in society but not for society but just for ourselves I think it's yeah. really really important yeah definitely I think the process of questioning gender and trying out new things is such a, a healthy way to grow and some people will do that and ultimately change from one binary gender to another. Some people will go backwards and forwards a little bit, and, and some people will land somewhere in the middle or completely outside it. But the, mm -hmm. the journey is the exciting part, I think. And it's in some ways been quite similar for me. Um, you know, I originally came out as non-binary and then came out as a trans man for a little while and then started to drift back to non-binary. And these days I definitely see myself as outside the binary, but I'm a lot more comfortable presenting feminine than I used to be and made the decision to come off testosterone a few months ago and feel so happy with the changes I got from it, but so happy to be offered as well. It's like it took me as far as it needed to. And now I'm on a, a new path. 
um yeah. it's uh it's always new with gender i think there's always new things to figure <laughs> out but it's fun yeah it's very colorful i think like that's the best way of describing it and i think that I, I think like people should encourage people to explore this stuff so that we can so that people can be comfortable with it i think it's really important that people are encouraged to you know just be themselves regardless of whether it's your gender or whatever it is you know yeah because i think it's really important to feel comfortable in your skin i don't think it really matters how you present it you know just as long as you're happy that's all that matters you know yeah definitely so i wanted to ask you know kind of off the back of that um do you still identify with the term trans or or have you moved away from that um i've kind of just come away from it altogether i don't really well, I'd, like to be fair with you, I think one of my issues is, is that I try to put a label on everything. I try to fit myself into a box. And I just think now, like, what's the point? Like, I'm just Stevie. I don't really have a label. Um, one of my friends will tell me that I'm a plus because I'm, you know, I don't fit into anything. Um, and I think that's kind of quirky and kind of cool. But at yeah. the same time, it's just, I just, I just say to people, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just Stevie, you know, and that's it. And I think, like, I'm, I'm trying to really move away from putting a label on myself if I'm, I'm being honest you know yeah. that's fair yeah I think labels sometimes there'll be points in our journey where they feel really liberating like oh my god I found a word that describes me and other times it feels so restrictive because if you don't quite align with any of them you end up feeling kind of stuck so sometimes just yeah. throwing out the the whole rule book and doing your own thing is the best way forward isn't it yeah definitely 100 percent and how were your experiences with the um, the gender identity services? You know, because I know you've you've had quite a lot of support from them at times. Yeah, so like um, gender services for me, it's been quite a, quite a journey, a long journey. Because um, obviously, when I first went into services, I wasn't really sure um, whether I wanted to go on hormones or because I know like nobody really prepares you beforehand. You know, you have this like two to three year wait. I mean, it's longer now. But when I was on the waiting list, it was only two years. Um, and, you know, nobody, like, really prepares you and really explains everything from a professional point of view, if that makes sense. Like, I mean, I mean I've mean, i got loads of friends who are in the non, like, who are non-conforming and who are trans who have, like, told me things. But, you know, like, it's, you know, it, it, you're not really prepared. So for me, when I went in, I was just like, oh my God, I don't know whether I want to go on hormones. I don't know whether I want chest surgery or not. I haven't got a clue. And I, I was just really open and honest with them about it and just said, like, this is where I'm at. Um, and I got, like, some help. And I went through psychosexual therapy for a year, um, which really, really helped me a lot. Um, it, it taught us a lot about myself and it helped us to discover the parts of me that I wanted to change and the parts of me that I wasn't really wanting to change. Um so, you know, I got a lot of support in that sense, but it's, it's been quite long-winded. Um, I had my, like, finally got my chest surgery um, in January, which for me has been one of the bestest things I've ever done because even now that I present female predominantly, I'm really happy with my top half of my body. It does not bother me anymore. I've, I don't have to, like, you know, I don't have to, like, I feel more comfortable in my clothes. I feel more like, and I've had a lot of support around that. And I think you know gender services for me personally I haven't had a really really bad experience but I have had a lot of ex like a lot of support and I suppose when you like put through you know when you want something so badly and you put you know you're on these waiting lists for a long time but because also I had the problems with addiction you know it made it even longer for me to get the stuff that I wanted because they wanted me to you know like get better and to recover and I needed to do other things as well do you know, it wasn't just that either, you know, I was very big in weight, you know, and I had to have support with losing weight as well, because obviously I wasn't going to be able to be able to have surgery unless I was under a certain BMI, you know, so I've had to like do a lot of stuff to be able to get to where I am today, but I wouldn't say that it's been a really bad process for me though, you know, I mean, back in the day I would have thought, well, why do I have to do this and why do I have to go this far, but in a way now that I look back, I think actually I'm really glad that they were like that with me because now I'm in such a better place, you know, in general. Yeah, you know, it makes sense. It's where sort of sometimes the the gatekeeping, as as we tend to call it, can sometimes be turned to a positive purpose. You know, if it helps to propel you towards goals that you already had and maybe just didn't have the motivation to go for, it can sometimes give you a, a nudge in the right direction. Where such an individual experience, where for some people it could be a real barrier, you know, to moving forward. But it sounds like things have just aligned in a way that's worked out really, really well for you. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think like, you know, like I said, like, I'm grateful that they did that to me now because, you know, I mean, like I said, I'm in such a better place um, because of that. 
and you know I wouldn't be where I'm at today if I didn't you know so I am kind of grateful I'm very lucky really yeah. in a sense yeah, that's good it's really positive it sounds it's nice to hear something really positive about the gender services you know other than the terrible wait times which we know are, are climbing all yeah. the time um, yeah yeah it it I mean, but it shows that more and more people are finding the, the, the courage to be able to, like, to value themselves enough to be able to do this stuff, you know, because I think, because it's not, it's not out there that much before. Like, like, I mean, when me and you started on this journey, stuff like this wasn't even spoke about then. It was kind of not like it is now, do you know what I mean? You know, and it's good that the waiting lists are bigger, but it's also not good when you're waiting, <laughs> you yeah. know, because there isn't the resources, you know, and I think now that there's more and more people, you know, it, 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 it's a real shame that there is such a long waiting length but it's really good that people are finally find, finding the courage to be able to be themselves and you know I try to look at it like that but I know it's easier for me said than done because I'm at a certain point you know where I'm getting things sorted um, and I know that waiting lists are really frustrating and I know waiting times are really frustrating but it's well worth the wait you know to be yourself um, yeah. you don't think that at the time though <laughs> Yeah, really it's hard to broaden it. your focus, isn't it? Because at the time, you're so focused on on the medical treatment that you want and need. Um, but there's so much more to exploring gender. As as we've talked about, it's not just about the hormones and the surgery. It's about that process of self-discovery. And there's a lot you can do to change your presentation before you even get into the services, you know, like um, changes to hair, makeup, clothing, Um even you know things like like voice training people sometimes are able to do through youtube videos that i know there's there's potentially bad habits you can pick up doing that so there's a lot we can kind of figure out on our own and figure out as a community really which is mm -hmm. the other great thing when there's community support available is we can kind of tap into that and yeah. and sort of build our own support system while we wait for the professionals to turn up and do their thing yeah definitely because I mean not everyone can afford as well private treatment you know like I know that I was never able to afford that um which I think can be for like us can be really frustrating you know because there is that option out there but it's not affordable yeah. um, for everybody um which means you have to unfortunately wait in those times but like you said yeah I think it's it's good to explore definitely good to explore because I, I I wish I did I wish I explored more because I think I, I would have been, you know, but hey, you can't change it. You can only move forwards. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Mm. And with the journey you've been on, I guess you've probably had to come out a few times now. Um, how's yeah. that How's that been at various different times? Um, I think like the first time it was um, really difficult. Um, it, it was like really hard to do. And then the second time, I, I think I've come out four times. <laughs> something like that um but um as like, i mean it, it's been okay it's been an all right experience don't get us wrong not everybody's liked it you know i've lost a lot of people from it but i've also gained so many people as well you know um and i think like in general for me personally the people that care about you the most don't care you know they really don't care um and they're the ones that you really want to keep a hold of um and i think now that I, I know that I've came out a few times and I know that to some people it's really confusing but when you're confused yourself it's kind of like how it is um but I've also um I've had a like autism diagnosis um in December and apparently a lot of people who are autistic have that identity like they, they find it really hard and it takes them a lot longer and they have to chop and change until they really find out exactly who they are because of the autism so now that I know that I'm like yeah that makes sense <laughs> it really does um, yeah. but yeah it, it's it's had its ups and downs it's never been it's not always been rosy but it's never been but it's also been really good too it's quite liberating you know because it gets a message out there you know that you can change over time yeah absolutely um and how has being you know part of the the trans community and the lgbt community in general been a, a part of your life um well, the trans community for me was really important and I, I cannot felt the trans community at all. Um, all my friends who are in the trans and non-conforming community have always supported me from day one, like yourself, for example. I, think, I mean, I've pretty much known you from the beginning. Um, and I've got other people as well that I've known pretty much from the beginning that have always supported me no matter what. Um, obviously, I went to a group, um, a local group, um, the same group as you, and that's how we met. 
Um, and I'm so glad that that was there because I mean, there was nothing else really around, you know, like I said, this stuff wasn't talked about. I found out about transgender and non-conforming. In fact, I didn't find out about non-conforming until I went to B. I'm going to say B. Um, you can, yeah, I had the chair on the last episode, so. Uh... <laughs> yeah, so like for me, that that's, you know, it's a, it's a place that I've always felt really comfortable going to. And it, I've like gained so much from it because back at the time, I didn't know what non-conforming was. I didn't even know that was a thing until I went to be like, you know, uh, and I didn't know what trans was until I met somebody who was trans, um, funny enough, um, because it, it wasn't spoke about back then on the telly. It wasn't, in, you know, it wasn't widely known um, out there, you know, media wise. And if it was, it wasn't something that maybe registered with me at the time um, because, you know, up to no good doing other things um you know and the world was kind of a blur yeah. um so I like I feel as if the trans community have always supported me always been there for me no matter what and I think that's really good and I've got a lot of friends from it um a lot of like good connections um LGBT community um I suppose for me um as you're aware I worked I worked in the scene here in Newcastle and it was in it was one of the um, something that was really good for me um, in a sense um, not in terms of my addiction obviously um, but it was in terms of um, really understanding the LGBT community as a whole um, and it, it, you know what I mean it had its challenges I'm not gonna lie you know because I was the only person in the company who was trans so a lot of people didn't understand it you know so I had to kind of like you know really like make like tell people how it was um, what I like, think and over time you know people started to understand they really kind of started to get it um, and it was okay um, I got a lot of support from my manager at the time it was really good um, but I suppose for me as well um, and this was before I worked on the scene I've had people in this like in the LGBT community who support me no matter what but I've also had people in the LGBT community who haven't <laughs> you know like who have been quite like Oh, I don't get it like that, nah, nah, you know, and said some things that have really hurt me, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, and you don't expect that from a community um, where you should really feel like you fit in no matter what, um, you know, and I have, I have had some bad experiences, but I try not to let that judge the LGBT community as a whole because not everybody in the LGBT community is like that at all. Um, but, but my experience is, is that I did have some of that. Um, but I, I try not to hold on to it now, you know, but I have got a lot of support down there. I've got a lot of friends, a lot of people who talk to me and who support me and, you know, stuff like that. So it's not all negative, but it does have its challenges sometimes. Yeah, I guess in, in any community, it's um, it can be like a very big dysfunctional family sometimes. So you'll have the people yeah. you really well with and the people who are absolute assholes and everything in between the two. Yeah. And how do you feel that your exploration of your gender identity over time, how has it impacted your mental health, you know, both positive and negative? Um, I suppose it's it's been a bit of both in general. Um, I think for me, like, my mental health obviously isn't the best. It's still not the best now. You know, I'm working on stuff. I'm going through some stuff at the minute, um, which is bringing up a lot of stuff for me. Um, but I'm working through it, you know. Um, but I think for me, you know, the positives is, is I, I do feel more comfortable as me and I feel more confident in myself, um, just a little bit more better, you know, and if that, that for me is something that's amazing because way back it, it wasn't like that at all. Like, I, I really hate myself, um, you know, and it has like bit by bit sort of to help me out. Um, and I suppose negatively, you know, I, I've not been very well for a very, very long time. And I don't think my gender is the only thing that's maybe like that. I think in general, it's just, you know, past experiences and things like that. But, you know, I'm working through them and hopefully I'll come out the other end soon. Um, but for me, like, yeah, I just think like sometimes, you know, like I think like my gender and my my exploration through my gender is very, very related to my mental health. A hundred percent, you know, past experiences and, you know, things like that. But. I'm finally getting the help of that so hopefully it'll lift a bit and I'll be able to you know do some more exploration and be happy about it you know what I mean and not think twice you know not let my head say you can't do this you can't do that you know because it does it does it all the time it tells me you're not this you're not that you know it does so hopefully working on that still 
you know, I, you know, I pull a lot of pressure on myself. And I think everyone does individually, you know, especially when you're like, you know, in the LGBT bubble. I think we all put this by proper pressure on ourselves. Um, and I think like once you learn that you're doing that, you can kind of work on not doing it. But it's a really difficult thing to do. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yeah, there is that kind of expectation, I think, in the LGBT community that we will all know exactly what our identity is and will have known it since we were like three years old. And, um, <laughs> yeah. and it's completely set in stone and it's never complicated or confusing. And I don't think that's the case for anybody, but I think particularly for trans and gender non-conforming people, it's always going to be more complicated than that because the changes that you're making are so far outside any expectations that have ever been set for us. And that's always going to be challenging. That's always going to be confusing. And confusion isn't a bad thing. You know, people are always so defensive, like, oh, just because I'm this, that and the other doesn't mean I'm confused. It's like, I'm confused about everything. I'm confused about how taxes work. I'm confused about how my washing machine yeah. works. I'm confused about when the buses run. Like, I'm certainly confused yeah. about my gender, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm exactly the same. Like, um, and I just, I think like somebody said to me, like, Stevie, just go with the flow. And I think like, that's, that's what I'm doing now. I'm just going with the flow, <laughs> you know? And I think like that's important. If you just go with the flow, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I thought we'd have a little chat about your addiction and recovery. Obviously, you've mentioned there that you have a past history with addiction. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that, how that was for you? Yeah. Oh, where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, yeah, I have a, a history of like substance misuse, um, obviously. Um, and I'm, I, you know, it was quite hard, like quite bad. Um, worse than what I ever ever thought it was you know like I really used to like proper like like devalue how bad it was and not really tell everybody how bad it was all the way from my recovery I've done that um up until recently um and I think I, do I think it's related to being trans tiny little bit but obviously there's other stuff as well you know I've been through stuff that's made me use I suppose um and essentially yeah I mean like I used loads of stuff but predominantly you know yeah I have a problem with fucking everything I haven't used everything but I know I have <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean I mean it, it's not just substance misuse it's food it's you know loads of things money I like I have like you know what I mean I'm addicted to spending money I'm a, you know I've got like do you know what I mean I've got like about 60,000 pairs of shoes that's over exaggerating but I like, you know what I mean it's just yeah addictions have been like it's really really like been a huge part of my life pretty much from a very young age all the way up until recently um so yeah uh, addiction <laughs> When do you think, when did you first start to notice it was becoming a problem? Because like you, I, I know it starts really young, usually with the early behaviours, but when did it start to really, you started to recognise there was something bad going on? I think when I, I recognised something bad was going on with me, when I, things around me just started to disappear, you know, like people didn't want to be around me, like people who I've been friends with for a long, long time, um, you know, nearly losing my home because I wasn't really technically, you know, spending my money. I had lost my job due to substance. I mean, I wasn't fired, but I was I was asked to leave to get better um, and stuff like that. I think, like, for me, I, I didn't realise it was a bad problem because I think, like, I had, like, that whole, like, denial and because I still had a job and I was still at uni and I thought I was manager. Um, and I suppose, for me, I think... When I started to realise I had an addiction problem was probably when you started to recover and I was starting to think, wow, well, I'm like them, <laughs> you know, and I had like that, you know what I mean? Like, it makes sense, doesn't it? Like, but you don't really see it because no one around me was telling me I was an addict because I was kind of like, you know, really like, I suppose, really good at hiding it to a certain extent. Um, and I don't think anyone understands an addict unless you're an addict. Do you know what I mean? um no one so if somebody's not an addict they're not going to tell you you're an, you're an addict um because I kind of hid at how bad my addiction was because most of my friends only see me on nights out they didn't say that I was still using in, in my house you know they didn't say all that um you know because I was really good at hiding it um 
they didn't see what I was like at uni um they didn't see what I was you know what I was like in my day-to-day life and um, because I kind of shut everyone out and the only time they see me was either if I was working or if it was like the nights out and socializing so everyone just thought it was just because we were all socializing you know what I mean and a lot of people be like oh it's only because you're a student you know or stuff like that and it's like it's not you know <laughs> I've got an issue yeah <laughs> It's one of those things, isn't it, where I think particularly in the queer community, but but probably for a lot of young people especially, um, as long as your addiction is sort of manifesting itself in things like alcohol and party drugs, and if people mm-hmm. are seeing you when you're out in bars, it's really easy for them to just assume that, that, like you say, this is just how you are on a Friday and a Saturday night and you're normal through the <laughs> week, and they don't see that the party continues for you for, for seven days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah, so like, I didn't know that. And then obviously um, my manager said to me, you know, you've got a problem kind of thing. He wasn't horrible to me about it. He was, he was really nice about it. Um, and I suppose the next day I, I, it just clicked. It was like, yeah, you've got a problem. But I think I knew I had a problem a couple of months before that, um, as you're aware, but I wasn't ready yet. I wasn't 100% ready yet until, you know, that final time, um, you know, because I still had everything to a certain extent. Um, so yeah, it was a lot harder for me to say it. Yeah, and I think for sometimes for some people, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely, it's it's much easier to kind of stay in denial like that when externally at least things seem to be going okay. It's it's when mm. when things start disappearing, as you said, that you kind of have to face up to the fact that at least some of it is probably because of of your substance use. Yeah, definitely. And how did your addiction affect you sort of physically and mentally? Were there kind of health impacts to it as well? Um, uh, yeah, like, so like, obviously, as you know, like the gender clinic, always check your bloods and things like that. And um, my liver um, wasn't very good at all because I predominantly drank more than anything else. Um, so they kind of clicked on and I was just, you know, just like, are you drinking too much? I'm like, no, of course not. You know, <laughs> while, while I'm sitting there, like, you know, half cut um <laughs> you know what I mean um the things you do and then they're just like oh okay then no problem but just try and you know reduce your alcohol and I'm just like yeah yeah no but I don't drink that much honestly I don't um so my liver in general wasn't very good I mean it wasn't bad or life-threatening but it was get- like if I kept on going it would have done um my mental health wasn't well at all you know I was not very good um uh you know I had you know as it's say it, you know you, you know yourself like I contemplated wanting to die, you know, it really, really took me to the bottoms of that 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 despair, I suppose. Um really, really and and I really hated myself using, you know, and then and then when I came into recovery, um I was exactly the same because I didn't obviously it wasn't to do with the fact that recovery wasn't working for me. I think it's just my mental health still wasn't the best. Um and yeah so it's like that I suppose for me you know my mental health was a lot worse when I used compared to what it's been in recovery I'm not like saying that I you know what I mean but it hasn't completely gone but it's not like what it was back then you know where it was constantly you know I mean I was like stabbing my soul by trying to stab myself (laughs) and stuff like that and obviously not obviously missing um clearly because I've got the holes in my, my couch and I'm still here um you know and stuff like that you know crazy stuff you know, that not a normal person would do. Um, and I suppose, yeah, so I think my mental health was definitely worse back then. And I wasn't really able to express it or tell people how bad it was. And when I did, it was to the extreme. It was always, you know, everyone should see it on Facebook and things like that. Um, yeah. You know, what I'm, you know, other than that, though, I kind of kept it to myself. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a very lonely, dark place in terms of my mental health, 100%. It, it it definitely didn't I, I mean I used not to feel I wanted to block out all my stuff but predominantly it made me even worse in the end you know it didn't do that anymore it just made me worse um so yeah my mental health was really affected like massively yeah yeah oh it's good definitely. to see you doing better definitely <laughs> um so what made you want to recover um I think for me it was I think like I just wanted to get my life back I think I just had enough I just didn't want to be out there anymore. And I think for me, that was important. Like, I just, I I didn't want to be by myself anymore as well. Like, I really didn't. I wanted to, 
I suppose, get my life back, you know? Um, and for me, that was kind of the, like, I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Um, and I needed to get help. And obviously, you know, a, I think for me, when I first came to recovery, I was very lucky that people like the gender clinic were saying, well, you're not going to get any surgery until you get, you know, clean. Um, and that kind of pushed me into recovery as well. Um, and obviously, I've seen you recover too, you know, um, and that really helped me a lot because I've seen that you could do it. So I was thinking, well, if Felix can do it, I can do it. You know what I mean? You know, because you do, you know, and it yeah. gives you a bit of hope. Um, and I think, like, right, for me, it's the best decision I made because my life is better. I mean, it's 100, like, it's 50% better, 60%, 70%, whatever you want to percentage want to put on it, to be honest with you, compared to what it was like then. And I just didn't want to be that person anymore. Um, you know, the night before I stopped using the last time, um, when I first came into recovery to give them the all, was really important because the night before I was so aggressive, so angry. Uh, everyone was getting annoyed at me. I was getting chucked left, right and centre out of bars by bouncers. Um, you know, not in a nasty way, you know what I mean? Like lifted up and taken out kind of thing. And it, and and I seen it on a video like how I was what I was like um because I was recorded having a fight. Um not a, like a fist fight, like a, a mouthy fight. Um and I'm thinking, wow, that I don't want to be that person. That's not me. Why am I being like that? Um and I think I was just like, oh I can't do this anymore. And I just remember then I think I messaged you first and was like, right, I need to come back into recovery. I need to give me all this time. I've had enough. And I never looked back since then. Um so yeah, it's, it's been like a process. But I just thought, no, nah, I just don't want it anymore. It's just not the life I wanted anymore. You know what I mean? I, I wanted what you were getting. I wanted what. And then when I see what other people in recovery had, no longer I was in it, I was thinking, wow, I want what they've all got. They've all got lives. They've all got good jobs. They've all got, some people got degrees. Some people, you know, they're just happy with what they've got. Like, you know, and they can have the smallest amount of thing and they're so happy. And I was like, wow, I want that. I want some of that. Give me that. Um, and it just really spurred me on yeah yeah that's lush it was really nice to get to play a small part in that process you know and, and see you <laughs> get that fire for recovery um because because i'd gone through that journey um and and i used to be such a like a recovery preacher almost i mean i guess in a way i still am with the podcast but um it's a, a different kind of approach these days but um but i really wanted to to give it to everybody um mm -hmm. And when I first kind of dragged you along to get a taste for it, I could tell you're one foot in, one foot out. So it was lush when you decided that for yourself that that you really wanted to make that change. Yeah, definitely. Because I think like, I mean, I share that with people all the time. I'm like, I literally only went to keep my maid happy. <laughs> <laughs> like I was literally doing it just to please you at first. It was just like, yeah, okay, just go along. Just do as you're told and just go. Because like, you're not going to be left alone unless you do. Um, you know, and that was predominantly the reason, but it planted the seed in me. So it did something, you know, um, which is why I like to say to people, like, just because someone doesn't come along because you've, you've, you've told, told them about this stuff, doesn't mean that one day they're not going to come back because now they know it's there. And that, you know, is important for people who are in addiction. So I think a lot of people don't realise there's different ways of recovering and there's different ways of doing this, but a lot of people don't know that helps out there, you know? Yeah. And I think that's really important. Yeah. Um definitely for me because I never had a poo I mean we were talking about rehabs the other day and I was like I, and I openly honestly said to people honestly I, I didn't think rehab was a real place I literally only thought they were either in America or Jeremy Kyle sent me and that was it <laughs> like I didn't even believe they were real places I honestly didn't and if they were real places were just for the rich people you know what I mean so I didn't understand any of that um until I came to recovery and I seen that there's so many different ways of getting this stuff it's just what works for you yeah. at the end of the day it's always a frustration, I think, that there's so many different, as you say, so many roads to recovery out there, and it's so hard to find information on any of them. You know, I spent 10 years in active addiction, and I'd, I'd heard of very, very few options, and I'd heard nothing really detailed about any of them. And then, as you say, when you're around the recovery community for a while, you hear about all the different types of mutual aid there are, you hear about different treatment options, different types of therapy, different medications, stuff that no one is really talking about as openly as they should be. And there's such a, a buffet of recovery out there that that we just don't get exposed to yeah definitely and I think it's like like you know like I, I don't tell anybody how to how to recover from addiction I think it's it's all a personal choice and everyone has different things to do um 
I mean, what works for me works for me. What works for you works for you. And that's all that matters. Yeah. You know, definitely. nothing else matters. As long as you're getting well and you're in a good place and you're able to manage whatever, then you're cool, aren't you, really? Um, yeah. Hi, brilliant. Um, and so tell me about what the process of recovery has been like for you, um, sort of what you did, how it felt, any challenges? So, yeah, I think the process of recovery, I think, like, for me, recovery's got its ups and it's got its downs, you know, it's not perfect. I think at first you think it's this beautiful thing and it's amazing because you don't have that, I suppose, seeing that life goes on and good things and bad things happen in life and you've got to get through them regardless. Um, for me, that was really hard to see because in my first year, everything went really, really well. And obviously in the last eight, like I think it's like the last 14 months, it hasn't been rosy for me. Um, you know, well, it hasn't been rosy for anybody with everything that's been going on. And I think a lot of people in who are addicts or in addiction, it's been a really hard time for everyone. Um, in general, you know, with everything that's going on, not having access to services, anything going on online, some people not having access to online, you know, and it's been really difficult for a lot of people. Um, so I think it's been quite challenging. Um, I find recovery, it, I love recovery, I still love it now. Um, and, and I think for me, it, there's been times when I'm thought, oh, I don't want to go. I really don't want to be there. Um, and I think for me, it's about maintaining it and saying that it's okay, I don't have to go all the time. I think in the beginning, it's needed. I, I definitely needed that like, if you're going to do something, you've got to be committed to it. Um, but I think over time, you become quite, quite balanced. Um, and because obviously I'm a structured person, as soon as I was able to maybe step back a little bit, it was like, whoa, can I really do this? Um, and it was just, it, and I was encouraged that I was allowed to as long as I had a healthy balance. Um, and for me, that, that's been something that I found at first really challenging, but over time now it's getting easier. Um, and I think some of the stuff that I find hard is getting vulnerable. Like, you know, getting vulnerable and telling people, like, where you're at. Talk about feelings. Like, I still find that hard now. Um, to say to somebody, this is how I feel inside. Because, you know, and I think for me, that's one of the hardest things about recovery for me. Because I'm an oppressor. I like to keep it all in. So that was really difficult. And I knew that I had, and I know recently I've had to let some stuff go that I've never, ever really discussed before. Um, and it's been quite liberating in a sense. You know, I'm still struggling with it sometimes. But I'm talking about it and that's what matters. But when I first came out, I wouldn't talk to a goose. I was quite quiet and I didn't know how to really communicate and stuff like that. And now I talk for England, I don't shut up. <laughs> and I'm really loud. <laughs> I, yeah, I was the same with vulnerability, which really surprised me because I've always been a total chronic oversharer. So, you know, when I was using, I would be off my head at a party and I would sit some poor person down on a couch with me and start telling them my entire life story with all my traumas in vivid detail while they were like inching away from me. Um, but I never once talked about my feelings. I would talk about everything that had happened to me and everything I'd done, but I would never talk about my feelings. Yeah. And when part of my recovery involved having to do that, I tried to fall back into that old behavior, be like, here, let me shock you with some horror stories. And when people were kind of like, no, no, how's that affecting you today? How are you feeling right now? It was so uncomfortable. Yeah. So uncomfortable. Um, I, yeah, I couldn't do that, like, at all. Like, at all. And I, I mean, I couldn't do it for a long time. I'm only just starting to. Um, but it's getting easier and I'm practicing it. The other thing as well that I find hard in the process of recovery is spirituality and the whole, like, like God issue. For me, that was really difficult, as you're aware. Um, especially when the program that I work on, you know, um, it's not a religious program, but my head was like, put the word God say, of course it is. Um, you know, and obviously with my past and things like that, with like the whole God issue, it was like, whoa, no way, whatever. And that for me was really hard being able to find my own spirituality and doing something that works for me. Um, yeah, so that that was something that was really difficult for me and it took me a long time to really like do you know if anybody mentioned it to me I was like no I'm not talking about that stuff don't talk to me about that and I literally took ages to get through my, my recovery to a certain point um you know and thinking I'm going to take up oh, because obviously you do in my recovery we do written work so like I was just like I'm not going to write this one very quickly I'm not going to write the next one very quickly because it all was related to like the higher power stuff and the whole like God thing. And I was like, that's not, I'm not doing that stuff. No way am I. Um, but now I see it quite differently. So it's been, that for me is one of the hardest things ever for me in recovery as well. It's just that, but 
I'm getting men, I've got my own understanding of it now. Um, and it, it and maybe me, I'm quite greedy. I've got quite a couple of things that I work with, but you know, that's just me. <laughs> Same, yeah. I could never just pick one higher power. I've got I've got a favourite, but um but I've definitely got other 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 beings and other things that I like to tap into. It's uh, keeps life interesting, doesn't it? Yeah. Aye. Um, so what does recovery mean to you? Big question, I know. <laughs> what does recovery mean to me? I think recovery at the beginning was getting getting off substances. And I think recovery now for me is being able to live my life without having to hurt somebody else and to be able to be a normal person. Like, well, I say normal because I'm not normal. No one's normal. But I mean, like, you know, for me, re recovery is an umbrella term for basically being able to be yourself and to be able to function as an adult or a human you know that's what recovery means to me um you know it means that yeah I get to have that freedom from what I've been through and I'm being able to move on from it all and to be able to express myself and I'm able to do you know what I mean I'm able to pay my bills now I mean like I've still got the same flat that I nearly lost three times in addiction you know, I pay bills. I mean, even the simplest things of being able to brush my teeth. It's the simple things for me, recovery. It's about, you know what I mean? I don't know if it makes sense or not, but I've got like, that, that's, to me, that's what it's about. It's about living life and, and trying to enjoy it and also dealing with the troubles. And if I can do that and recovering, then what more do you want? Do you know? Yeah. Everything else is a bonus. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's that nice kind of symmetry with what drove you into recovery, you know, where it was your addiction was starting to take everything from you and it sounds like recovery has has either given it all back or given you new things that are just as good you know and and that's that's how how we kind of grow and and start to feel more like ourselves again yeah definitely i think like i've definitely got a lot back and um, you know definitely got more coming into my life as well i've got to, i mean i'm looking to go back to uni this year um, after taking three years out and that's really exciting and um, I'm dead looking forward to it because I know that now I'm ready I'm prepared to go back and finally get a degree um, whereas if I continue to go on and on and on I wouldn't have been able to maintain that so I'm getting that back and I'm, you know I've got food in my cupboards I've got electric you know I'm able to I mean I've thanks to being in recovery I've been able to work on um you know, losing my weight and things like that because I, I used to program tell me that as well. And um, you know, to manage my eating and to look after myself and things like that. And I think I, I gained so much more. I mean, I've got friends as well, both inside and outside recovery. I've been able to get, you know, a connection with people who maybe were a bit distant and I've got them back in my life. You know, I, I've now got my niece in my life, which is really, really important to me, and um, who I never seen up like up until this year on FaceTime. Um, I mean, just five in July, um, you know, it's stuff like that. That's what recovery gives you. And that's the stuff that I hold on to because it's just, it's just beautiful stuff, you know, and I got to meet her. I got to meet her last Saturday for the first time, basically. And that was amazing. It was amazing. I guess, yeah, I already thought that's I know. Nice. And I'm dead excited because it's just like, yeah, I can spoil you now. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yay, get me close. So, yeah, you know, I've gained so much. I might have lost lot. But I've, because I've worked on myself I'm now gaining things back and people actually want to talk to me you know people want to be around me like crazy really crazy yeah I never imagined that people would want to be around me <laughs> a few of us always did a few of us yeah usually the ones who were a bit of a mess as well but um, <laughs> a few of us yeah did. I think when I was in a like I think a lot more for me like like yourself and like other people that we know that have been close to me because people kind of, once people got to know me and got to understand me, a lot of them accepted me. It was more people who didn't really understand me. Um, and obviously now I've got stuff now I can say at the moment, it's because I'm this, this and this. Whereas back then I didn't have all that either. And I don't think it would have ever, I mean, it's really hard to diagnose autism when you've got addiction problems because addiction and autism are very similar. Um, they've got the same traits and things like that. So I think while I was using, I would never have got that either fully. I mean, I've always been aware of it, but I've, now I've got a definite diagnosis. And there's like other stuff as well. And I think, wow, I wouldn't have that if I wasn't in the place I'm in now. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That's brilliant. Um, so what would you say makes recovery different for trans and gender non-conforming people? Sort of any, any challenges you've come up against? 
I think what well I think because well my program up here we have quite a small um group of people it's not as big as it is in other areas so it's not as diverse and I think a lot of people don't really like until like people like me and yourself were around they didn't really understand what non-conforming and transgender really was um and I think it's very it's it's like it's like everything in general isn't it um you have like you know in society it's very male it's very female and it's you know and I don't think like and I think like but you know, I've never felt like I could, I'm not wanted there or I'm not allowed to be there. That's, that's like, I'm not saying that, but it is very like that. But I think society's like that as a whole. Like, it's, it's like that anyway, around the world. It's everywhere. Um, in some places, it's better than others. But I think it is difficult because you don't, me personally, I, I find it really difficult to, I mean, now I do anyway. I, I, I talk about it anyway, you know, and I discuss it. And I'm always open to say, look, if you want to talk about it, we'll talk about it. And I've always been that person um that's never ever changed but I think what makes it more difficult for the likes of me and you is that we might find it really difficult to share about that stuff because predominantly up, up here in the northeast it's not very at the moment very diverse so therefore you know you don't have many people you can bounce off to and say well this is what I'm going through related to my gender and a lot of people are like oh I don't understand I, I can't help because obviously they're not like you know like us which is totally fine that's okay I, I totally understand it but I think it needs to be difficult to discuss this stuff. And I feel like sometimes it's been something that I've really found difficult to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, other than with the one person that I like, I'll share my written work with and things like that. And she's been amazing. She's amazing. And like all my friends and that have been really good with me. So like I've had no like negative experiences at the moment presently about me coming out as female again or anything like that. So you know, it has, like I say, it has its challenges and it doesn't have its challenges. And it's just, it's just predominantly remembering, you know, I'm there for me and hoping, you know, and I can only discuss it and I can only talk to others and have these conversations. But I think it can be quite difficult. I think it's, I mean, I, I can't really talk for non-conforming people because I don't understand to a certain extent. I do, but not fully. But I can say why sometimes it could be a bit more difficult because, it, like I said, it is very binary still. But that's because I think society is, um, in general. I don't think that's just related just to recovery. I think it's just like that anyway. <laughs> you know, it can general. be. It can be. I guess where it, it tended to get tricky for me is the sort of within certain recovery communities, the kind of expectation of a, a little bit of gender segregation. You know, of men helping men, women helping women was um, yeah puts you in a position of having to choose. <laughs> I mean, I can see why it's there. I, I get why people say that, but for me, it was like, well, who do I ask to go through my written work with? Can I have a female? Can I have a male? Um, what what's this? And you know, and that that bit was difficult to be honest with you. Um, I've had both male and female sponsors. I've now got a female sponsor, and I absolutely love her. She's amazing with me. She's great. Um, she understands it, you know. And pretty much from the beginning, you know, I've never really had to tell her anything about explained about like my, like for example when I got my surgery she I, I told her what it was called and she went on google and things like that looked it up and got information about it so she could talk to me about it and understand and I think that's really important and mm. um, but I totally get the whole male for male men for men and not really I mean in other areas you have like LGBT meetings and things like that and I think like up here we didn't we, we, we tried but it didn't really hit off but we hope hopefully you know we are starting to get that back a bit and hopefully it'll allow people to maybe have that opportunity but I know other people who are in the LGBT community who also struggle with the whole man for man women for women do you know in terms of their sexuality like who do I pick as a sponsor who do I not you know um should I be talking to the women should I be talking to the guys <laughs> like but for me you know I don't care you know for me I look at more, for me it's more about my motives am I be you know am I talking to this person for the wrong reasons or am I talking to them for the right reasons and um, gender doesn't come into it for me at yeah. all but that's just for me <laughs> yeah no it makes sense and it sounds like you've found a way of navigating it that works for you it's just it's one of those little kind of extra complications little niggles isn't it in the in the early days particularly um so you touched on spirituality earlier so I wanted to ask a little bit more about that <laughs> what has your experience of spirituality been in recovery um well as you know it was quite challenging I've already explained why um so for me like at first I think when I first came in recovery I, I kind of just used the weather um I would just say the weather 
I'll, I'll pick the weather. <laughs> um, and I kindly used the weather to start off with. Um, and I just couldn't get the whole spirituality thing still. Uh, it took me a very long time about, in fact, about just under a year in recovery, about 11 months to really find out what, what works for me. But up until that point, I literally did use um, the weather. Um, every time my sponsor would mention the universe or whatever you want to call it these days to anybody who, who wants to pick whatever, um, but my sponsor says the universe, and I would be just like, I don't want to talk about that. Don't talk to me about that stuff. I do not want to know about that. Um, and I didn't want to. And as I left, she would giggle because um, she would say to me, I, I, I was very like that as well when I first came around and stuff like that. And she would like explain things and stuff. Um, but now I've explored it a lot deeper. You know, I, I've got tried, like I said, a numerous amount. I've got like three things that I tap into. Um, and then it did it did evolve um, eventually. I started to talk to other people around me in recovery who like yourself and other people and thinking how can you be dead spiritual I don't understand that like how how do you tap into this stuff how do you like because people say pray and I'm like how do you pray if you don't want to pray um you know and is there other ways and and I didn't know there was such a huge range of things out there and obviously being trans or or LGBT automatically when you hear the word higher power you think well higher powers don't accept people like us like that, that's the way that I've seen it because unlike yourself I didn't really explore that in detail before recovery so in my head it was just like well they're all like that aren't they? they're all against people like us um and I started looking into it um a bit more and now I, you know I don't find it as difficult my spirituality is you know I have obviously I've learned a lot about spiritual principles and recovery and you know and things like that and I use them a lot um, and I suppose spirituality for me is about exploring um, I mean I do look at I look at nature I am I'm, I'm, I kind of class myself as a neo-pagan which is kind of like we'll explain it it's kind of like I know you'll know but for everyone else I'll explain what it is so neo-pagan is somebody who believes in paganism but still has a religious set religion so that can be like christianity muslim whichever you want to pick and kind of merges the two together and for me that kind of works um and you know for me that it was just like because I, I was kind of torn between the two and then i was just like and then i found out what neo-paganism was i was like wow that's me i love that and i just tapped into that um and i also think that for me my, like because obviously i lost my nana in november um, and I believe that my nana has looked, since she's when she's looked after me, you know, like, as you're aware, she passed away and within 24 hours I got told my surgery, that I would have, like, consultation for my surgery, um, the night of her funeral, um, I got, got the message from my niece's mum, so, like, I thought, wow, I can really tap into my nana as, a, as well, so I kind of use my nana too, um, and that's what works for me. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's just, it's just about being able to be open-minded it changes all the time the way it evolves all the time you know for me the higher power stuff the spirituality stuff yeah you know i don't set it in stone because it can change it can become different but i'm okay with that yeah similar to your journey yeah. with gender i guess you're just going with the flow yeah 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 i definitely am like like i said like i mean i, I mean i go to church on a sunday i mean would you imagine but i go to a church that's really accepting um, and the, the, you know they've got no bound, like bound boundaries you know and I, I like that so I, I go to that as well which you you know like you would never have got me to go to anywhere like that um, at all before recovery so I suppose recovery has given us that the idea of being able to explore wherever I want to explore and I don't and I feel as if for me recovery told me like I said to you a bit like what I've experienced with my gender you know you don't have to stick to one thing you can explore whatever you want I know people who pick from all various different things and put it all together in one. I think I kind of do that as well. If I like something, I'm like, oh, I'm going to do that. I don't really just stick to it, you know. If there's something that I like and I think that'll work for me and my spirituality, I'll, I'll use it. And I don't. And then as long as, you know, you've got that, I think that's all that matters. You know, everyone's is different. Fantastic. So looking forward to the future now that you're kind of on track and it sounds like things are going really well for you, what are your, your plans for moving forward? Um, well, I'm just gonna, I think I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. 
and I think my plans are you know as you know I do a lot of art and things like that I'm really looking for you know and I enjoy that it really helps me um and you know I think definitely working towards getting back to uni continuing with because I've finally got into mental health services to help me with my past which has been something that I've had to work for really hard so I'll be working on that as well and I suppose maybe just trying to get a life that's outside of recovery I think that's definitely something that's my goal now because you know it's great to have a life in recovery but like I said before I think you have to have that balance and I'm starting to reach out good like our club stuff like that and I think for me that that is my future you know finding that balance between the two it's yeah. definitely one of my goals that I'm working on at the moment and just being me and not like I think for me the biggest thing ever is just not to care what other people think because you know what I'm like I think about what everyone's thinking oh I can't do this I can't do that oh what's that <laughs> but I'm working on it so yeah. oh, that's lush sounds quite similar to sort of my kind of recovery goal this year has been all around balance you know like looking at the areas of my life that were totally skewed to one thing or another and and learning mm-hmm. how to correct course on that and I think it's so much harder than the kind of early days of hardline all or nothing recovery or you're going to die, you know, do nothing but recovery 24-7. But that isn't sustainable. It's it's how people burn out and it's finding ways to bring the rest of your life into into your routine and maintaining structure without rigidity. It sounds like you're, you're on a good track. Yeah, I think because for me, I, I think for me, I have to have abstinence because for me, my problem was, you know, I had a problem with drugs and I, and alcohol as well so I just I can't really have that you know flexibility in that that sense but I do know that I don't have to be in recovery all the time I just know that I have to be working recovery all the time I don't have to be in it all the time yeah um, and I like that I like the whole like balance of it I think you know you need to get out out there you need to explore you need to do the things that you want to do you know and make make friendships outside of recovery too you know you're not set in this boundary where you have to stay in this boundary and I think at it, it, it first it is important but I think because of the whole situation the world's been in over the last, I don't know how many months it is now, just over a year, I think it's been really hard for people who, like myself to be able to get that balance between not being in recovery and being in recovery. Because at the moment, for a long time, all we had outside of being in the house was recovery. So yeah. it's been really hard to find that balance, you know. But now that things are starting to move now, I'm starting to get that balance, you know, I do different things, you know. So that's good and I'm enjoying that I'm enjoying just being able to you know just just yeah just do like because I think that's what recovery is about it's about being able to live your life and recover at the same time you know and if you're not enjoying your life then I, for me personally my recovery is not working I've got to be out there I've got to be doing what I want to do you yeah. know and enjoy it yeah definitely definitely um and how is your life different today than it was before recovery <laughs> it sounds like it's very different to be fair <laughs> it, it's very very different it's it's I couldn't imagine what like to be honest with you I think now that I'm where I'm at now I forget how bad it was and I think sometimes I have to do things like this to realize well actually wow that, that's where you're at and look at you now and you know now I've, I've been thinking for ages you know you haven't really done that much you don't do very well but I think when I do things like this for example I think, wow, my life's completely, like, upside down, do you know, compared to what it was then. I've got so much more, and I've got so much, like, more, you know, because back then I didn't want to live, and now I feel like I do. Um, you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah, I'm trying to, like, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I've got loads. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <Awesome. Rainbows. laughs> and what advice would you most want to give your past self? another big um, one. <laughs> my past self Ooh, good question <laughs> I think if I was to like talk to my past self I would say don't take any notes of anybody that's around you just do you and don't worry about it <laughs> and if you think that what you're going to do in the future is going to solve you then think again because it's not <laughs> sounds that's like it. good advice and finally, um, have you got anything you'd like to promote? I know you mentioned your art before. Are you still running your art page and things? Yes, yeah, so I've got an art page. It's called The Teal Gallery. It's on Facebook. Um, I'm, co- I'm not working on the web page at the minute, but I am hoping to put up a web page. Um, I do a lot of um, creative writing and things like that, a lot of photography too. And I just try to like promote that. But I mean, I'm not really selling anything pro- pro- properly, but 
you know, without recovery, I wouldn't be able because I guess like I that's another thing. Without recovery, um, I just I couldn't be creative without using as well. I just didn't think that I could be creative without using, and now I can be. I can be. I can. I can create things now, and feel okay about doing it without having to feel as if I have to be. You know, using to do it, which I know sounds like a really daft thing, but. It, it, it's huge so for me yeah the teal gary is really important because it started off as something so small and it's like right now i've started to do different things with it and really allow myself to be creative because i think I've, I've always been a creative person um you know so yeah that's it i haven't got anything else to really promote I, i'm not really doing that much apart from you know no, that's brilliant. And I'll um I'll pop a link in the description of the, the video as well. And for people listening on Spotify and other platforms, if you just search the Teal Gallery on Facebook or if you go on my YouTube, it'll be linked from there. Um, but that's brilliant. Thanks so much for coming on and we'll leave it there. Thanks again. No problem. It's been good. It's Yeah, it's really helped us loads, actually, because I, like I said, this stuff helps me to see how much I've come on. Because sometimes I forget. So it's important. Definitely important. Thank you. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll be back for the next episode of Not In Vain. I'll be rounding up the last three episodes with my usual commentary, analysis, and the odd spicy opinion. See you soon.